Here's part two of the 1957 Radio Shack catalog, the second half, chock full of goodies for the electronics enthusiast. We pick up where we left off in part one with pages and pages of parts. Just pause it if you want a longer look at anything. So anyway, as I was saying in part one of this video, there were these kinds of kids we all saw in high school, not just in electronics, but also in biology and chemistry and the other sciences, astronomy, and in the arts too. These were the kids who kept to themselves and did what they were interested in doing. And I was one of those kids. But these are solitary pursuits for the most part, not social events the way team sports are, So the really popular kids weren't interested in this kind of stuff. It just wasn't social enough. So the popular kids kind of looked down their noses at the techie and arty kids, if they looked at them at all. They didn't see much value in doing something that wasn't social. So the irony is, the popular kids, the ones most likely to succeed, they wound up, well, let's put it this way, for the most part, they peaked in high school. Plugs and jacks. Great. Panel equipment. Antennas. Insulation. TV boosters. Ah, yes, you used to stick one of these on your TV to help you get better reception if you're living out of town quite a ways, in what we used to call the sticks. Amateur radio. Oh, yeah, ham radio. That's where Radio Shack got its name. A ham shack or Radio Shack, is where your amateur radio gear is, where you go to talk to the world by voice or the dots and dashes of Morse code. Whether it's in an actual shack or down in your basement, it's your Radio Shack. Back in those days, in order to do ham radio, you had to have a license from the FCC. And in order to get the license, you had to know and have some proficiency with Morse code. Now, how are you going to learn Morse code? You can't learn it by yourself. I tried. I memorized it. I tried to practice at it. Oh, here's something. Here's a Regency ATC-1 amateur band converter. That is one of the early Regency devices, and it's transistorized. You know, Regency made the first commercial transistor radio, and that is one of their other little gizmos early, early on. A little metal box. Anyway... Back to my story. So the best way, of course, would be to learn Morse code with a friend or a patient teacher who already knew it, and you could set up your keys and send Morse code back and forth to each other so you could then increase your skill level. But I had no one. No one willing to do that. You know, when you're out there by yourself doing that thing you're doing, it's not a social thing. And I could not find anybody who was interested in learning Morse code. And so I never did learn it well enough to take the exam and I never got the ham radio license. Today, I don't think you have to know Morse code to get the license, but I don't know. One thing I do know that hasn't changed is this. The popular kids in school still have no interest at all in coming over to your house to help you practice Morse code. Test equipment. This is something I don't know much about. My approach to testing stuff was to wiggle everything. Flick all the switches and wiggle everything. If that didn't work... I would take out the tubes and take them down to the dime store and test them. Then I'd put them back in, and if the thing was still misbehaving, I'd thwack it a few times. Especially in the back where the transformer is, where it's dangerous. Do not try this yourself. Don't do it. I believe in test equipment now. But why was I so ignorant and unwilling to learn about it then? Well, I guess that's 50% the culture in which I grew up and 50% my father. He'd tune up a car in the garage until it sounded right. He wasn't going to take it to a mechanic and have them put it on a machine. That costs money. It sounds good to me, he'd say. And when the TV was on the fritz, he kept his TVs going for years by flicking and wiggling and thwacking. He'd get behind the set, holding my mother's hand mirror in his left hand out in front of the set, and he'd start thwacking away while watching the TV picture in the mirror, jumping and zigzagging. Don't try this at home. Don't do it. Radio kits. 
crystal radio kits, little peanut tube radio kits, Fillmore stuff. Yeah, I like to collect this stuff now. Educational electronics out of Chicago. That's fun stuff. Electric tools, hand tools, and all kinds of tools for your hobbyist needs. This is where I first heard of needle nose pliers. All kinds of goodies here. Cutters, punchers, snips, saws, strippers, nut drivers. And not just one, but an assortment of soldering irons. And here's the order blank. You can send that in and they'll send you the goods, once you've figured out how to estimate the shipping with the postal zones and all that. Alignment tools. Radio hardware. Dial cord. Paints, lubes, cements. Grills and chassis and plates and racks and bottom plates and bases. And books. An entire book section. This is where you learned how to build and repair things right. I never did. Headphones. Now, headphones were not like they are today. They were not that at all. Headphones were worn by telephone operators, airline pilots, and ham radio operators. That's it. That's who had headphones. It wasn't until the Walkman that wearing headphones in public became a thing. Not until 1979 and the Sony Walkman. Microphones. Oh, yeah. This is the stuff I like. Yeah, the very idea that I could talk into one of these and be heard somewhere else. So cool. I'm doing it right now, you know. PA systems. What does PA stand for? Public address. You knew that. Today, they refer to this as sound reinforcement. Intercoms. Miss Jones, would you come in here, please? Take a letter. And here are some actual radios. Let's see what they had in 1957. Transistor radios. Quote, sets are very famous make. Can't advertise name, end quote. Well, the name they're not mentioning is Emerson. Here is something called a 13-ounce pocket radio. Now, there's a catchy name. I don't know what this is. I don't recognize it. Model K544. I don't know. Is it a Dewald? Because that's what the others nearby are. And off on the right, some tube radios, I believe. On the left, a two-transistor pocket radio. Well, that's an odd way to sell that radio. It's an Emerson 856, a hybrid radio with three sub-miniature tubes and two transistors. They're calling it a two-transistor like it's a toy or something. And here's a Halicrafter's El Diablo. Oh, and here's the Regency TR1. They have it turned sideways and have it marked down to $44.95. They're blowing it out because this radio is like three years old. So where are the pocket radio replacements for it? All these radios on this page are all big. All big honkin' portables. Where was the American manufacturer to step up and say, hey, that Regency did well enough. Let's us make a pocket radio that's a little cheaper, a little better, a little smaller. Where is it? Well, it's not here. It's not offered in this catalog. Can you think of a smaller, better, cheaper transistor radio available in 1957? The one that comes to my mind is the Sony TR-63, but that's from Japan, and it's not in the Radio Shack catalog either. Given how immensely popular the pocket transistor radio became just after this, it's almost funny how clueless the big American radio brands were. Oh, they were quick to outsource, as they were doing with a vengeance by 1960, but to innovate? Not so much. And here's the index. And here in the new products section is an earphone-only pocket radio with three tubes. No transistors and no speaker either. The 1957 Radio Shack catalog, as mailed to this guy. I loved getting these things in the mail, and I returned the favor by sending them as much money as I could. Here are older catalogs from Lafayette Radio out of New York, 
an Allied radio out of Chicago. These are before my time, kids. I'm not that old. I hope you enjoyed this video, and check out part one, which is the first half of this Radio Shack catalog. There's vintage hi-fi there, and lots more.